Hello, it's me. I'm in <clears throat> the dark world and I'm coughing. What a brilliant start to a live stream. I'm going to wait till there's a few people here. What do you and me want to talk about? Just me alone. Um, uh, that Barbarian movie sure is People Under the Stairs. Zach Cragger, the director, was in, believe it or not, uh, except for it's <laughs> People Under the Stairs is People Under the Stairs. Barbarian is Person Under the Stairs. There's more, I will say there's more stairs in Barbarian than there are in People Under the Stairs. Um, however, there is more, there's also more staring in Barbarian because it's a much slower paced movie than People Under the Stairs. People if you, Under the Stairs, if you haven't seen it, it's a Wes Craven movie. Wild, wild one. Um, almost a children's adventures movie, but like in the world of a horror movie in a depressed neighborhood, there's only one white family and they're like this rich white family, but they live in this sort of suburban house that seems like it's been kind of turned into kind of a fortress and uh, a little kid. I wonder what actor that is. I wonder if that guy ever did anything else. He's this adorable little black kid is the main character of that movie. But then I think it's also Ving Rhames' first movie, which is fucking amazing. But it, it was really interesting because I saw Barbarian and it, it is, it's people under the stairs with less stuff. It's a modern, it's A24 presents people under the stairs because now everything, Barbarian's so well directed too. Zach did an amazing job, but everything now is sort of like, well, what it was then, but manage your expectations. Like, and that was kind of why I loved, it's what you've seen before, but a little bit more normal. Like Hereditary is a brilliant, awesome movie. But a lot of the scares are like things we've kind of seen in other things. And we at the end, it kind of goes, yeah, I'm a demon movie. And it starts doing demon movie stuff. And a lot of what we do now is how we dress up these tropes we see again and again in things. And I think there's enough people here to start talking about what I wanted to talk about, which was there's this Critical drink, Drinker video. I don't know if you watched a Critical Drinker. I'm a big film YouTube guy. Or I was. Now I really only watch a few people. We're past the golden age of film YouTube. But... I, I watch The Critical Drinker still, and I like him now because now he's like woke. Uh, comparatively, he used to, he still does the names thing. Jim Cornette does this too, the names thing where they, if someone has a foreign sounding name, they'll make fun of it sometimes. And it's like, uh, you're kind of giving away the game there that you're racist. <laughs> it, it hurts the argument. But I was watching this Critical Drinker move thing about remakes and I've watched all these videos and heard all these podcasts. And it's been years and years now. People have said, wow, Hollywood is so driven by like remakes and properties. And then aligned with this, I want to tell you about something. And maybe it's obvious, but maybe you'll actually be like, oh, that's interesting. Because when the drinker made his video, he didn't know. When it ended, I thought he was going to say, he says a lot of smart, true things in that video about the film industry. But from someone who's been at the top levels of the film industry, some of the stuff he says is always like, you know, there's this idea, there's this idea of the film industry and then there's what it actually is. And, you know, it's been a while since I've been an active big shot. So like, I'm sure it's changed even more. And from my, what I hear gotten even more scary and depressing out there is the world of indies keep shrinking, shrinking. And there's less and less art house indies and more and more of the indies are these trash, you know, red box movies of like the cable man. And it's like just like an actor you've maybe seen in a TV show on the cover and he's like this with a gun and there's an orange thing and a car and a bomb. And like it's just you watch it and you're like, what the fuck is this? Who made this? Who wrote this? Who was passionate about this? And the answer is not a lot of people because passion right now is increasingly not the driving force of – the artistic ventures we've been watching. And of course, everyone knows that. It's, oh, commercial stuff. Sure, commercial stuff. But Michael Bay loved making Transformers. Like, he's an artist. That's a director with a vision. That's a director's movie with an identifiable style. You've probably noticed increasingly stuff, especially the Netflix stuff, all the action kind of looks the same. It's all lit the same. You know, even you see it creeping into movies now too this sort of tv digital looking what am i looking at is this is this a fucking tv show and then you see something and it's so funny because it really is the filmmaking the passion and the care given because then you see something like severance on amazon and it's as beautifully shot as beautifully and inventively productive production designed 
as any movie ever has been. So now I'm going to focus in, sorry, Red Bull. Now I'm going to focus in and say that there have been these two narratives for years that have existed around the film industry, which is the diversity narrative and the idea of the message, the idea that wokeness, get woke, go broke, wokeness has infiltrated movies and done all these bad things. And then there's this separate narrative of everything's a remake. Everything is fucking just an adaptation. Everything's based on something. Everything's a sequel. <laughs> I want to reveal something to you, which, which you might find really interesting. So to do this, we're going to like rewind a little bit to the 90s. Remember in the 90s when we had, for a minute there, for like 10 years, we didn't have any A-list Asian actors from like 2005 to 2018. But in the 90s, we had several. We had Asian women, Asian men in our A-list pantheon of Hollywood stars. It was extremely diverse. Lots of black men. Lots of black women, people like Chris Tucker and, you know, fucking so, so many people who the 2000s kind of left behind. Wesley Snipes, I could keep going. Denzel Washington was already becoming a huge star. I could keep going. You know I'm right. Danny Glover was headlining movies. Um, crazy to think about now. Think about now if like a big studio movie came out and started like a 58-year-old detective. Like, okay, I'm being ADHD. Back to the center. These two narratives, wokeness, remakes, they are the same narrative. Whoa, Fight Club twist. They're the same guy. And to explain that, in the 90s, there was a real trend coming out of the 80s, which was scale-driven and director-driven. Into the 90s, when things got really screenwriting-driven, um, with the rise of the Weinsteins and Miramax, I hate to... They did great shit. I mean, like... And they got what they got. So why even cringe when you mention them? He's in prison. I don't need to cringe. That's mean that I cringe. He's in prison? Okay. Well, fuck him. But it did lead to specs becoming more and more important. People like Shane Black and Fred Decker and a lot of people became more and more important. That's why you saw all these really interesting creator-driven movies that sort of popped up in the 90s. Also, adaptations in the 90s were almost always twists on the thing. It wasn't about adapting the thing right. It was about doing the cool version. People are upset or are pretending to be upset about Black Little Mermaid. Yo, in the 90s, we literally had Black Cinderella with, with Brandy, right? Like people, no one cared because they were like, oh, that's cool. This is a new version of this. To do adaptations in the 90s, it was all about doing the new version. Even when they did, oh, that fucking great movie, Al Pacino, Jack Lemmon, Glengarry Glenn, Glenn, Glenn Ross, right? Glengarry Glenn Ross, incredible play. But when they adapted it for the movie, the most well-known scene in the movie was written for the movie. The Alec Baldwin thing where he teaches them how to sell at the beginning, that's not in the play. So even the adaptation had to be more. Fight Club, fucking genius. I mean, they fixed that. I like that movie better than that book. American Psycho. The book is a horrifying nightmare. The movie's a comedy. And things like The Matrix got made, idea-driven things. It got very, very... But then people got cocky, right? People kept trying to remake The Matrix. There were all of these different original idea Hollywood blockbusters that came out in a row, like a lot of them. If, if 142 people are watching, I want 142 likes. But you probably remember some of them. Do you remember Push with Chris Evans? Um, where they have psychic powers or Jumper with Hayden Christensen. In the 2000s, they went, okay, we're going original idea driven, screenwriter and director driven, because now in the 2000s, going into the, from the sort of 98 to the 2005, you were in this crazy period where guys who didn't make sense for A-list projects, crazy New Zealand director, directs the goriest movie of all time, right? Directs a movie about... Killer Yogurt, right, okay, comes to America, directs The Frighteners, it flops, gets the biggest studio film trilogy of all time. It could only happen in the 90s. Holy shit. That's like, what the fuck? And then you look at Oddball Guy, weird director, has directed cult classic horror 
and a couple of good thrillers, but you wouldn't hire him to direct Spider-Man. Why not? Why not? Artist-driven, fucking artist-forward Spider-Man movie. Looks like a cartoon. Totally ridiculous. They don't try to make it cool. A zillions of dollars. And those successes led to the experimentation of the sort of fake matrixes, the attempts. A lot of movies around this time, they, they have like endings that sort of have like cliffhangers of some sort. And it's like, oh, and there will be more in this franchise. But then it never came. And then some of them actually took off. Underworld is a sort of a product of the fake Matrix era. And that got shitloads of sequels. Resident Evil is, a pro is something that took off, got shitloads of sequels. Okay, but by the time 2008 rolled around, a truly crazy thing happened. Number one, the iPhone came out. Number two, the housing market burst. Number three, Dark Knight, a director-driven auteur, the first fully Nolan, because Batman Begins, you can still feel the studio, which is good in some ways, but the first Nolan Batman movie hits theaters. You know what else hits theaters? A corporate enterprise. The Marvel comics, it's time to capitalize on those characters in a real way. There's a lot of them we can get our hands on the rights for, and Iron Man drops. Who's at the end of, you know, it's like the end of that movie, you're in the Iron Man world. Iron Man is not, that movie, when you watch it, watch it structurally, screenplay-wise. It's not a movie. It's an origin story. It's a totally different sort of thing. Because at the end, when he goes, I am Iron Man, what that moment means and where all of this will go is so clearly the focus of the climactic emotions of that movie of like, here starts the story. Movies don't usually end like that. With, with someone being like, and now I am a superhero. Think of most superhero origin movies. Midway through, they have to fight the villain and do all this stuff. In Iron Man, the villain shows up deep in the third act. Deep. It's a character study. Like, that's so weird to think about now is that was an episode. Whereas Dark Knight ends kind of on a cliffhanger, but it's this philosophical thing. And you wonder, will the Joker return? Marvel's Iron Man is the start of a series. Dark Knight is the is a sequel to Batman Begins. One of them is a movie and one of them is a film, if that makes sense. That, a distinction that I, I don't know needs to be made. How, how like cracked out am I coming off right now? I feel like I'm just flowing. <laughs> I went nuts. Okay, so the narratives, the twist, how they're the same thing. Around 2010, 11, there became this flood of the next wave is superheroes and comic books. And around 11, 2011, 2012, I get to start having meetings. Max Landis starts existing in this world people always theorize about online. I'm there. And I get to witness how crazy the land grab is for what can we make that's based on something? What can we make that's based on something? And at first it's what can we make that's based on something because that'll be a hit and they think that's a safe bet. Okay. That's important to remember. Everyone says now, you know, online, you've probably heard people make remakes and, uh, and, uh, property, you know, IP, intellectual property, people do that because it's a safe bet, they think. That is no longer true. I'm going to rock your socks because this is kind of crazy. So IP becomes the thing, whereas originals move increasingly into TV. I become known. The whole reason I ended up on like the cover of a magazine is because I started selling original ideas. One of the narratives around me that's so insane is that I'm a hack. A hack is a guy who works for studios. Uh, again and again, works on studio projects. I was like in the spec world. So I was fucked because I was right at the top of, I'm a guy who loves to make original ideas. I love original movies. I love stories that exist first as movies. And I love all the things that that, that can give us. I think there's something really special about a movie being the origin point of a story. I think Alien is, is 
so wonderful because it, it utilizes Geiger's existing art, right? It utilizes an iconography that it kind of, not steals, but transforms. It's almost an adaptation of Geiger's art into story and performance. And it being the, or, there, there was no book alien, I, I don't think. <laughs> there was no book RoboCop, he quickly corrected, I don't think. No, there wasn't. No, no, there wasn't. There was no book robot. There was no book The Matrix. There we go. Well, William Gibson. But there was no book The Matrix. And I, my whole life, want to create these movies that are like originals and, and cool new ideas, right? So I started selling those, but so few of them got made. Like American Ultra, Chronicle, Mr. Right. Bright, me, him, her. I guess most of my movies are original ideas other than Frankenstein, which was, again, a reworking of Frankenstein because I knew I could sell it. And that was what was so funny is increasingly I was told the way to sell things is by doing adaptations. Except for I really remember around 2015, it became religious. It stopped making sense. It stopped being because it's a safe bet because this thing started happening. And this is the thing I'm here to tell you about. They would publish comics to then sell with comics that no one had ever read that would never sell in comic book stores. It was almost like a money laundering scheme. They would publish comics in order to say their thing was based on a comic. And that was how people were trying to sell things. People are going to other countries. They're finding movies that weren't hits. And they're just getting the title, they're completely rewriting them, and then they're putting them as like, this is based on something. So even, the, even something that no one knows about and has no market research, you need something. And I remember when it changed and selling originals really got hard because Bright was the, the last, uh, that's not true, Shadow in the Cloud. I try to do fucking new shit, man. I, I'm not interested in endlessly being regurgitated things, but because as it became religious, there were less and less, there was less and less room. And especially as theatrical movie going kept dying. Thanks for buying tickets, guys. Actually, thanks for fucking us economy. But, um, you know, this crazy sort of weird transformation happened where originals became too risky and you can only do IPs. And I remember people were like, finding books that hadn't been published yet. And so the book would come out at the same time as the movie, but it was an IP. You see what I'm saying? It's religious. It doesn't make any fucking sense. A script is a book. A script is a book that hasn't been published yet. What are you you're finding? A, that's It's like the most ass backwards, weird thinking. And it was normalized completely. And so it comes to this point where there's less and less opportunity for something new but what were there not a lot of in the past necessarily big movies that starred black or gay people there are a couple there are a couple but not those big ips people want to reboot so now in order to do a new star wars you want to have an opportunity to make a new cool female you want a new cool female role for a new type of movie, right? Well, there's an opportunity in Star Wars. You put a woman at the front of that. And then the writing of how that all works, I have my own opinions on, you know. But what's so interesting is the reason there are more and more, it's not just like this bullshit, there should be more representation, the message. It's because there's less fucking roles. Because there's less fucking new shit. So there's less opportunity for diverse people. This movie Prey is a great example. It, it, it's a great way for uh, opportunities for all of these actors in a way that makes sense. But what is it? It's a sequel. Imagine if there had been a new movie by the same director, because he's a good director. The same screenwriter, because I like Prey. Same actors. Everyone. But it wasn't Predator. But same budget. You know what that movie could have? Sequels. You know what that movie could be? An original success. But we don't get that because they're too scared. So increasingly, the adaptations are feverishly loyal in some ways. And they learn that from Lord of the Rings. And they learn that from Marvel. And they learn that from everything they adapted from 
you know, 2000 to 2010. But now there's no opportunities. Everything's a copy of a copy. So you have to like forklift women and gay people and trans people into these things. Why the fuck even do a Lord of the Rings TV show? Why is that money not in a TV show that's an original of that scale? Imagine, let's do it again. Same cast, same everything, giant show. When's the last time you can even think of something like that? Like they just tried to do six Game of Thrones in a row. Not actual Game of Thrones, but remember there was like a billion of them on every channel. They tried to adapt everything and they all failed and they all ended after season one. And they all, everybody shit on them online. There's too many women. It's too diverse. This isn't like the original. Well, if it was an original thing, no one would give a shit that the women and the diverse people were there. Everyone would be excited for the original thing. But there's this religious thinking going on that's like, no, 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 nothing, nothing too risky, nothing too risky. A24, A24 is now a mouthpiece for some movies that are really great and interesting and other movies that are art house stuff and they advertise them the same because there's so few distributors now to advertise the art house stuff and to distribute that because there's so few theaters because film is going through a deadly transition. But it's just so crazy to think about, dude. Like Return of the Jedi is more diverse than The Force Awakens. You might be right. That might be true. Okay. That's what I was saying, is that the critical drinker, he makes good points, but ultimately he doesn't understand that they're the same narrative. The reason these people keep getting forklifted into things is because originals are not so much getting made featuring diverse casts at the scale of movies he's talking about. It's true. It's true. You can't even think of one. You know, The Matrix, you know, it's, but that's a remake and a sequel and a, you know, it, it's the same narrative. The get woke, the, some things are obviously like designed to agitate the internet, but really the reason things have gotten so much more diverse is the claustrophobia of the remake culture, the IP culture, crushing the amount of roles for diverse actors. And that's my point. And uh, I did a longer form video that I think you guys will like, and there's more stuff coming, but I just wanted to hop on and say that. <laughs> Thank you all. Give me a thumbs up, please. If you're watching, give me a thumbs up, please. You're not. You give me a thumbs up right now. There it goes. Okay. Thank you guys for the thumbs up. I appreciate you. I give you a thumbs up. Have a good night.